you have your Bible, and the first thing I hope you do, you turn to John, the third chapter, at least one to seven verses. I've entitled the message something a little different today. It's called uh, An Interfering God. An Interfering God. If you stand, I know you've been standing, but would you mind standing to honor God if you can? If you can't, that's okay. You can stay seated. John, the third chapter. In verse 1. Now, as you're going there and finding your place, I want to read just a previous verse before that so you can understand what's taking place here. Uh, it says in verse 23 of chapter 2 While he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many people saw the signs he was performing and believed in his name. But I want you to notice this. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them. For he knew all people. He did not need any testimony about mankind, for he knew what was in each person. And so something was happening there that was kind of unusual. They saw the miracles and they believed in his name, but he would not entrust himself to them because he knew what was in each of them. And so he understood that there was not a right relationship with them. Now let's go to chapter 3. Now there was a Pharisee by the name Nicodemus who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and he said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God. No one can perform the signs you're doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, very truly I say unto you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. Well, how can someone be born when they're old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb and be born. Jesus answered, Verily, truly I say, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and of the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to the Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. You may be seated. An interfering God. A God that interferes. Now, what we're seeing here is Nicodemus, who is now coming in a, a choice, a decision, a crossroads, if you will, and, and to maybe enter in a relationship with Jesus on a different level than maybe he had already been. But it wouldn't be easy. This wouldn't be easy for Nicodemus. Maybe there'd be uh, too much problem with him in public to follow Jesus. And so, you understand, he's coming at night. Here he's coming at night. Kind of like trying to be an, a secret admirer. You know, what would people think if Nicodemus was coming to Jesus? Uh, might cost him something. It might be something that would cost him a relationship or his status in the community. But becoming a follower, that would be a little more risky than what he already experienced in his life. You know, a lot of people, I think, don't really come to follow Jesus because there's a risk involved. There may be a risk involved with relationships or work or a standing in the community or whatever it might be. Now, they don't have a problem being a fan, but there's a difference between being a fan and a follower of Jesus. Amen. <laughs> there's a difference. You know, a lot of people are fans. I mean, they're fans of sports. They're fans of rivals and TV. They're, they're fans. They go to a event now and then, but... You know, following is a whole other matter that happens in the life of a Christian and a believer. So Nicodemus is at a crossroads. He has some decisions to make, choosing between religious and a relationship with Jesus. You know, what about you? Now, again, he came by night. You see, if he comes by night, nobody's going to see him. They're not, not going to they're not gonna know that he's coming to Jesus, so he comes at nighttime. Now, he had all the time in the day to come to him. Why didn't he come in the daytime? He comes at night. Called a secret admirer. Many people call him that. Uh, you know, at night he could avoid, he could avoid awkward questions. Uh, you know, about like, uh, are you a follower of Jesus? You know, and he would have to answer. You know, a little bit like Peter. Remember when he denied him? You know, oh, I don't know him. No, I don't know him. I don't know him. No, you're wrong. And so Nicodemus could be in an awkward position. Uh, you know, at night, he could spend time with Jesus without anybody knowing about it. Uh, 
he could have kind of a casual relationship without having to make any real changes. I think I think that's a problem sometimes with folks is they, they like to make commitments with nobody knowing about it. Because you see, if you do that and nobody knows you've made a commitment, then there's no accountability, there's no responsibility to it. But when you declare yourself that you're a follower of Christ, then everybody knows. And everything and then everybody then they're expecting to see a change in your life. They're expecting to see that you're not the same person you were before. They're, they're expecting to see a difference in a change. But if you do it kind of secretly without anybody knowing it, then there's no accountability to that, you know? He could, Nicodemus could come at night and it would not affect his position, status. A lot of people feel that way, you know, at the job, if we don't really declare ourselves, uh, then nobody in the job is gonna question, they're gonna, not gonna treat me any different. And so now, Maybe it's a little better to come at night. You know, his, his fans, or friends and family, they, they wouldn't have to, to know about it necessarily. You see, fans are happy to follow Jesus as long as it doesn't require any real change in their life. They don't have to worry about any negative implications. But here's the truth, and here was the point of the message. We have an interfering God in us. And if you're a Christian, God's going to interfere with your life. Now, what does it mean to interfere? It means that somebody is going to get involved without being asked. You know, now, most of us don't like anybody to interfere with our life, do we? You know, don't interfere with me. You know, I'm going to do what I want to do. Don't tell me what to do. And, you know, and we're all that way in one way or another. We don't want anybody interfering with us. But here's the truth. If you're really a follower of Jesus, God's going to interfere in your life. He's going to come to you and rub you sometimes the wrong way. He's going to come to you and expect changes. He's going to come to you and reveal things to you that maybe you weren't seeing in your life that needs to be changed. This one scripture in, in the Message Bible out of 2 Timothy 4 2. That's the scripture where Paul's talking to Timothy about preaching the word, instant in season, rebuke with authority, and all that. Listen to the Message Bible. It says this to Timothy. So proclaim the message with intensity. Keep on your watch. Tell All right, grab your shoes. Warn, urge your people. Don't ever quit. Keep it simple. Now, let me show you some scriptures that talks about Jesus interfering in our life and why he interferes in our life. A familiar passage to you would be in John the 15th chapter. This is Jesus talking about the branches and the vine. And in John the 15th chapter, Jesus says, I'm the true vine. My father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that does not bear fruit. Did you get it? He cuts off every branch in me. In me. So somehow they were in Jesus. Maybe they were like the people previously in the verse that they believed in his name but didn't have a real good relationship. Maybe they were just fans. I don't know. But he says, every branch in me that doesn't bear fruit, I'm going to cut it off. And then he goes on to say, and here's the intervening or intervention of God of our lives. But he says... Well, every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes it. He prunes it. So why? So it'll even be more fruitful. You know, pruning is, a, is an interesting thing. My wife loves flowers. We have a lot of beautiful flowers around our house. And, and I can't remember what you call it, what she does, but on certain flowers, and the ladies probably know this, on certain flowers, uh, when they're not blooming the best, you have to pinch them. And it, some of you ladies know I'm talking, you, pin, you pinch them and, and you take it off so they'll bloom more. And so, you know, if you're going to do that, we've got two apple trees we planted when we retired and moved into our house. And, and, you know, they're growing up. But what happens after a while, some of those branches get a little wild. Some of those branches aren't really coming to a nice shape in the tree. And so some of them, this fall, I'm going to have to, to prune. I'm going to have to cut the lower branches off so that it won't just shoot off in any wild direction. So pruning is a necessary thing to be more fruitful in our lives. And Jesus is saying here, basically, I'm going to interfere, I'm going to interfere with your life. If I see something in your life that may not just be what it ought to be, maybe there's an attitude that needs change. Maybe there's a habit that's not pleasing to God. Maybe there's something you're not understanding or seeing in the Word of God on how you ought to act and what you ought to do or where you ought to go or not. Somehow there may be something. If you're a follower of Jesus, God is always going to be coming and pruning your life. And we, most of the time, would say, ouch, I don't like it. Don't show me that, God. Don't, don't 
show me that I'm being this kind of person. Don't show me I need to change that. Don't show me uh, that I have to rearrange and change my life now. But God is an interfering God because he wants you and I to be more fruitful. He wants us to glorify him, to show people we're his disciples. And so he will come and interfere and prune and clip and take all that stuff that kind of is useless in our life or going in the wrong direction. And he'll do that for us. Now another scripture that's interesting is Hebrews the 12th chapter. In Hebrews the 12th chapter, it says this in the fifth verse. It says, and you, have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father, addresses his son? It says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. And do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines the ones he loves and chastens everyone he accepts as his son. So now we have not another interfering part of God in our life. He's saying, maybe I have to discipline you and spiritually spank you. you know? uh, none of you parents have ever had to do that with your children, have you? Ever had to, to, to correct them and discipline them and say, look, you know, this is... I know some people, they don't spank their kids anymore. They just keep saying, no, 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 don't do that. No, don't do that. No, don't do that. And the kid just keeps doing it. And they keep saying, no, don't do that. Don't do that. You know, because you can't spank me. I'll send you to jail if you spank me, you know. The law says if you beat me, I'm going to send you to jail. And so, you know, now, now parents have to say it's a timeout or sit in the corner or whatever it may be. I'm, I'm in productive sometimes, but, you know, you can't do that. <laughs> My kids are grown, and my daughter wouldn't let me do that with grandson, so we're safe there. <laughs> but, you know, if you love your children, if you really love your children, you're going to correct them. You're not going to let them just be wild and do anything they want to do. You want them to grow up to be responsible children, adults, and citizens in the country. You know, that's part, if I can say this, and I think I'm preaching to the choir, I understand but that's part of the problem we're having in America. Children haven't been raised to respect their parents or anybody else and discipline them, and they're just going wild. That's why the protesters are doing what they're doing. That's why a lot of things are happening, because, man, nobody, you know, ever ever really corrected them. It's just like, let them go do what they want to do, and they turn into wild adults. They were wild children. Now they're just wild adults. Well, in the biblical sense also, God doesn't want us to get off in the wrong tangents where we should be. He wants us to be responsible, godly people who reflect the love of God in our life. So he's going to prune us from time to time. He's going to clip off stuff that shouldn't be there. He's going to discipline us because he loves us. Now, I know when you're a child growing up, you think your dad or mom doesn't love you when they correct you. Amen? That's what you think. But... <laughs> I don't know why so many are looking at each other. <laughs> Not to point out any names. <laughs> Kurt. I mean, uh, <laughs> Kurt's over there. I'm not doing a thing. <laughs> they just look at each other and laugh, you know. Uh, Landon and Nick are over there like, not me, no, not me. But if you love them, you want them to, to grow up to be responsible. God wants us to grow. He wants us to be followers, not fans. There's a big difference. So the scripture talks about God interfering in our lives. And it comes to a decision oftentimes in our life about how that's going to be. Because most of us, most of us don't mind God making minor decisions for us and changing, but don't make a big, big difference, you know, in our life. But see, God, God is. You know, we, we talked oftentimes, and I, I don't know if I mentioned this back in time, but the kingdom of God is what we call an upside-down kingdom. And I mean this. In this world, the scriptures talk about if you want to get ahead, just jump on everybody and over everybody, right? God's kingdom is, you no, know, if you want to be a servant and up do it for God, you got to take a lower position. You know, in, in this world, people don't want to forgive anybody, but the kingdom says... You know, to get to heaven, you've got to forgive the beast. It's always an upside down. What's the same thing in God interfering in our lives? He's not interested in a touch-up work. God wants to make a complete renovation in our life. Second Corinthians 5, 17, any man, any woman, boy, girl, whoever is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old has passed away, and behold, all things become new. God's not interested in a tune-up. He wants a complete makeover. He's not interested in just being partial. He wants everything. He wants a complete new model. God's interested 
and interfering with our lives. Jesus would not accept a relationship with Nicodemus just because he simply said he believed. Jesus wanted Nicodemus to follow him. Jesus didn't want Nicodemus at night. Jesus wanted Nicodemus all the time. God wants us all the time, every day, in every way, not just on Sunday morning, not just now and then. And the difference is between decision and commitment in our lives. You see, belief is more than just coming to church on Sunday morning. Belief is different, and following Christ is more than just a prayer now. It's more than just coming to an altar once in a while. It's more than just attending now and then. Following Christ is more than just a casual commitment, if you will. It's a life change. It's, a, it's more than just a mental ascent or just coming and maybe even standing or sitting or singing or doing whatever we do. It's a commitment to really follow Jesus. Matthew says this. It's, it's Matthew 16. Talking about a fan or a follower. In Matthew 16, 24, then Jesus said to his disciples, I hope you're getting all of this in the scriptures. I mean, all that we've read, the thread that runs in there about God wanting us to really follow him and interfering with our lives so that we can totally follow the Lord. And Jesus says this, he said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves. And we don't like denying ourselves, do we? We don't, we don't want to deny ourselves pleasures. We don't want to deny ourselves anything. We want everything. We want it all. And he says, and, and take up their cross. You know, a cross. A cross is a symbol of agony. Now, it's a symbol of victory, but it's a symbol of agony. I mean, Jesus died on the cross. They crucified him. It's like a spear in his side, and the blood came out. You know, for people, a cross is like, oh, man, I don't want a cross. That's why I think a lot of churches across this country are taking crosses out of church. They say it offends people. Well, I say it offends people. My Savior died on the cross and came out of the grave for me. And he says, you've got to deny yourself. You really want to follow. This is how he says, take up their cross and follow me. There comes up and follow me. Not just be a fan of me, but actually follow me. Hmm. What's it mean to really follow Jesus? Well, I'll tell you one thing it means. It means to obey him completely. It means you don't just obey the part you like in the Bible. It doesn't mean I'll obey this because that sounds right, but I'm not going to obey that part of the Bible. It means to follow Christ. It means to obey all his teachings. It means to strive to be like him more and more every day. It means to be a person who is not just a casual acquaintance, but it means somebody who daily seeks to serve the Lord and love the Lord and do the Lord's will. It means, in essence, when he's talking about denying, it means to lose your life. You know, he, he went on to say in the scriptures that what, what's a gain? What profits it good for a man to gain the whole world? Lose his own soul. To be a follower means I'm going to lose my life and my identity in Christ Jesus. Now it's him. I'm going to allow him to lead my life. I'm going to follow. Instead, sometimes I, I know pastor for years of people like, well, Lord, I'm going, you follow me. You know, here I go, and I'm going to do this or do that, and you come along and follow me. It's not a case of asking Jesus to approve what we're doing. We need to ask Jesus to be approving of what he's doing, finding out what he's doing. To follow Christ is more than that. It's a daily endeavor. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 15, 31, the Apostle Paul said this. The Apostle Paul, who believed, most people believe Paul is the greatest outside of Jesus in the Bible, in the New Testament. Most people say he's the greatest outside of Jesus. Man of God, you know what he did. I mean, just by him going to people, people were healed. Paul started missionary journeys all over the world. And here's this great man of God. And what's he say? I die daily. I die daily. What he was saying is every day, every day when I get up, every day, I make a choice, am I going to follow Jesus or not? Every day when I get up, am I going to deny the fleshly things? Am I going to deny the things that come from the flesh that, that I think I ought to do or want to do and maybe I shouldn't do? He's saying, I'm dying every day so that I can please God, run the race, and make heaven my home. 
See, when we decide to follow Jesus and quit being a fan, then we will want to know Jesus on a deeper level than we've ever known him before. To really have a personal, up-close relationship with Christ. So let me ask you, what's your story? Are you ready for God to interfere in your life? Or is it, I believe in Jesus. I'm a big fan, but don't, don't ask me to follow. You know, I just, I'll be a fan. I'll, I'll be in the outskirts. I'll, but I'm not going to really get in a close relationship with Jesus. I, I don't want him flipping me, pruning me, trimming me, disciplining me. Uh, I'll just be a fan. I don't mind to come to church on the weekends, but, uh, and I don't even mind praying for my meal. I'll even slap a Jesus bumper sticker on my bumper. But I don't want Jesus to interfere with my life. I have my plans. I, I have my goals. I have my ideas. And I kind of want Jesus to agree with me. You know? Where are you at? Are you a fan or a follower? Do you, do you, do you mind uh, God interfering in your life? Do you mind that when God seems to kind of nudge you and say, you know, you, you ought to change this maybe. You ought to go in a little different direction here. You, you know, some things that I see maybe aren't that pleasing in you. Maybe you're a little offensive. Maybe you're a little disobedient. Maybe you're a little too something. I don't know. You, you, you know, people oftentimes say, what do you mean, preacher? One of my favorite heroes of the Church of God movement was a name of Dick Bradley. I know a few people you know him, those of you, yeah, Lynn, I know Lynn does, and some of you that were in Newton Falls would have to know Dick Bradley. Outside of Lily McCutcheon, he was probably the greatest next in line for Revelation stuff. And I remember Dick saying one time, and I kind of picked it up a little bit, he'd go to preaching on, he'd be preaching, and people say, what do you mean? He'd say, whatever you're thinking. Because <laughs> you see, God, God had already spoken to you. He's already spoken to you this morning. I don't have to know, you know, but God knows. So it's whatever you're thinking, what's God really saying to you?